right. Good morning, all. That's much better. So where is Mark? I need to give that. Good morning. Okay. Um, first things first. I wanted to troll Dale Peterson. I've been to many S4 conferences, and I got to say, CS3 has better production value, better quality, and dare I say, at least equally good content. So someone tweet that and make sure Dale knows. But first, things, first thing I wanted to do personally is thank the CS3 staff. Um, this is an outstanding event. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a round of applause, because this is a fantastic event. All right. So I'm going to talk about some of our future, um, at least as I see it. This is not just a particularly American perspective. I get enough of a, I'm lucky enough to be on the CCI board. I see a lot of Latin America, a lot of Europe, some of Asia. So this is some of the stuff that I'm seeing in our, I would say, OT world, but I'm getting kind of tired of this because it's been, I don't know, I've been doing this for like 30 years or more. We're still talking about OT and IT. We're still bitching about OT and IT. Uh, they can't, they don't get along. Is it easier to make an OT person an IT person? Is it easier to make an IT person an OT person? Come on, guys. Eventually, in the not too distant future, this is just going to be T, right? It's, everything's going that direction. We'll talk about some of that. You got to have an adversary slide. Mine's real simple. Your adversaries have three things you don't. They have people, they have money, and they have time. Anyone in this room have all three of those things? I want to work for your company. No one has the same amount of people, money, and time that your adversaries do. You're outgunned. Face it. So th we'll talk about what this means with respect to security, probably toward the end of the event of the uh, of the presentation. But it's it's real simple. I mean, we can talk about how they do it, what they do it, uh, with their technologies, their 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 techniques, their practices and procedures, tools and methods, sources and methods. Honestly, they have three things you don't. You, there's no way you can match them given enough time. So we have some options for that. There we go. Okay, so who's heard of Hanlon's Razor? Any, any takers in the audience of Hanlon's Razor? Okay, for those who don't know, <clears throat> despite the adversaries having all of this capability, people, money, and time, you're outgunned, most, if not like 99.9 .9 plus percent of the events, issues, outages, disruptions we see in our world, in the OT space, ICS space, stupid humans doing stupid things. Hanlon's razor, do not attribute to malice that which can adequately be described by stupidity. Basically, humans making mistakes. They're not necessarily stupid. They're well-intentioned in a lot of cases, but people make mistakes. Almost all, like a very, very high number, very small margin of these things are actually attacks. All of this stuff, effectively, is humans. The difference between what we're trying to do for security, we're trying to keep bad guys out trying to keep those you know, intelligent adversaries out. At the same time, to get business value, because we all work for companies that make money, you need to think about actually this is a different perspective. We're trying to keep the process running. We're trying to keep the lights on, the water flowing, the gas moving, manufacturing process in, in place. It's a different mindset. Part of that is keeping people from doing stupid things. So let's talk a little bit about the environment, kind of set this, the, the perspectives. Uh, any software developers in the room? Any hands, software developers? Okay. I know quite a few of them, and they're probably some of the laziest people I've ever met. Um, not that that's a bad thing. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. It, but the, what, what it's created is a situation where we've got embedded code inside embedded code, inside embedded code, and we've embedded ourselves so deep that, honestly, we really have no clue what is really down at the bottom of all of this. Now, why, we do, why do we do this? Well, write once, reuse, right? That's, that's the way we do things. <laughs> I mean, I do it. I write scripts, and I'm reusing scripts I wrote, like, years ago. I've got to, I don't think I'm using any basic scripts, but still, some things that are pretty old. Most of the developers I know with the big, long Unix beard, they're still using stuff they wrote years ago. We, we, re, we write this stuff, and then we embed it, and then we share it, and it gets embedded. Um, so we're basically reusing and borrowing our way into this kind of unknown state of vulnerability with the, the firmware, the code, the compiling stuff. It's, it's, it's very challenging. Part of where we're going with this technology trajectory is, uh, you know, I've been in some plants, I've been in some electric facilities where you've got like a refrigerator-sized RTU. 
some of the technology back in the day was massive. I mean, remember, you know, like rooms just to hold a computer at the time. Now we can get, you know, all of this technology, you know, on something the size of an iPhone, right? What's it going to look like in five years? You won't be able to see it. It'll, it'll vanish from the human eye. The technology will be so small and so capable and everywhere. You won't see it. You, you won't be able to walk through the plant and immediately do a visual inspection because it will be hard to see, if not invisible. Um, if you're curious how small it can get, look up smart dust. It's a thing. You can actually do wireless, no battery, environmental sensing with dust-sized nanoparticles. I think it's a project by, I think it's Stanford. I know there's one at MIT as well. It's a real thing. It's already there. Technology is already going beyond the human eye, and it'll continue to do so. It'll just work into your fabric. Connected, everything will be connected to everything else. All of this smart stuff, that smart dust, this thing, it's going to be connected to all the other interesting and new uh, tiny technologies that are doing amazing things. It's also going to be connected to that refrigerator-sized RTU that you can't get rid of because you have to keep it around. Um, that's going to be the challenge is how do you manage the breadth of connectivity that you need to manage a modern facility when in a lot of cases you can't get rid of that legacy stuff. And that's going to be a challenge. But the communication protocols that we're getting into now, it's, it's going to be quite easy to let, literally let everything connect to everything. It's just That's where we're going with this. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> so this, um, I've, I've tried to wrap my mind around, and I've come up with a really funny long word for this that in one of my presentations called Made Up Words. Um, but the best thing I can think of is it's the logic, I call it logical distance. What is logical distance, right? We know what geographic distance is. Maybe it's 200 kilometers from the control center to a substation. We know that, right? Logical distance is all of the technology stack between the human operator, clicky clicky, and something out in the field moving, breaker opening, valve opening, whatever it might be. That's the logical distance. Mouse driver, keyboard driver technology, all the, all the network stack of the different protocols, whether it's going from maybe some radio into fiber, right? All the different conversions that go through every one of those little devices. Um, your comm aggregator, your DAX, what is a, all of that technology stuff that you're putting in there, we're shimming more of these things in between the human clicking and some action happening out in the field. That's the logical distance. And we're stuffing more and more things in there such that this distance can effectively grow as long as we want. It can go as far as we can possibly insert technologies. How far is that, right? Are we managing that? Are we actually thinking about all of those different components? Because as Monte Elkins can show you, if it's got a chip, you can hack it. I mean, my favorite one is the, the drill. I mean, Monte hacked a drill and made it play the Star Wars theme. That's cool. Okay, but anything, anything with chip at all. This thing, hack it. So as we insert more and more and more and more and more technologies between the human operator and what happens in the field, what we end up with is called the automation paradox, such that as we automate more things and introduce more and more technologies to do more things based on a human action, the criticality of that human action goes up. So the more we automate, the more important the human operator's actions become. That's an interesting paradox. So, there's a balance in there somewhere. I'm not really sure where we're going to find it, but I'm sure we'll fall down a few times trying to get there. Innovation. Um, IoT, IIoT, smart this, smart that, smart dust, smart everything, smart toothbrush, smart fridge, smart coffee pot. Coffee pot's talking to your car, says, hey, fire up, human's getting ready. Okay, This is our future, and we're, all of it is, frankly, just ridiculously vulnerable. We're deploying stuff right now that's just frighteningly vulnerable. Um, there's a lot of folks that would say, stop. Slow down. Why? That's like saying, stop breathing. Humans innovate. That's what we do. It's part of our creative streak. It's just it's part of our fabric. It's, it's humans. Telling us to stop innovating is a very bad idea. Telling us to slow down, not going to happen. What happens when your parents say, oh, don't do this? First thing you do is go do that, right? It just doesn't work. It's not going to work. Stop it. Stop asking us to, to slow down. It's not going to make a difference. We're, consumers are going to demand these and they're going to wave money in the faces of other people to make them and it's going to happen. I challenge you, it's your job to secure it, even in that state. And you don't like it? Get out. It sounds harsh, 
But that's your future. Complaining about it, bitching about it, whining about it, it's not going to make a difference. Getting on board and figuring out how to solve this incredibly difficult problem is what this room full of smart people is supposed to be doing. Get busy. That's your job. Okay. The August 2003 blackout in the U.S. Uh, sequel slammer, some other things happened. What really happened is summer, and some lines sagged, and they hit a tree, and the protection system did what it was supposed to do. Took out the system, opened some breakers, shed load. That's what a power system does. The interesting part of the incredibly long and detailed report was the systems that they used, their EMS, their energy management system, what they used to view their transmission environment, was rebooting in the process at the exact same time that the lines went out. So protection system kicks in, system's rebooting, operators effectively can't see what's going on. They're flying blind. What we didn't realize at the time was their dependence on that technology was so high and they were so used to Windows reboots that their operators literally went and got coffee while the techs came in and got the system back up. At the same time, bam, blackout happens. And of course, since it's uncontrolled, it just starts to cascade through most of the Northeast. And Northeast America was blacked out some parts of Canada for a couple of days. It's a pretty big chunk. It's a lot of lost money. Some, definitely some human impact. But what, what this highlights and has been a question ever since that report came out is what is our dependence on these technologies? Um, there's some talk now in some countries about inserting possible manual options. How do we continue to run the system without the technology in place? Could you do it manually? It's always the question. You know, we go through, uh, I was, I wrote some of the NERC SIP standards. Don't shoot me. Um, uh, I was the first NERC SIP auditor in the nation. Uh, don't shoot me. Um, so I've, I've been through the regulation side. I've worked for the asset owner and actually implemented the standards there too. So I've seen all this whole picture. Um, it always comes down to the question of, okay, what's critical? What, which systems here are critical? And the operators are like, none of this crap's critical. We could go manual. We got this. We got it. We're good. It's like, how long? Ah, oh, we can go months. I'm sorry. Bullshit. <laughs> There's no way you're going months. Absolutely not. Schedules rotate on the hour. They, they, at least in our country, and I've heard about it at least in Europe as well, you have a standard process. It requires technology. You might go a little ways by using like faxes, and spreadsheets, because that's what it's going to go to, like cell phones, faxes, and spreadsheets. How long can you run like that? How long can you run a transmission system like that? Not possible. We are so dependent on our technology that in reality, it's just like when you leave your iPhone in the cab. Most people literally shit themselves when that happens. There's like a, they've got this, it's like a psychological term that comes over you, this panic and sweat when you leave your phone somewhere. It's actually a real thing. We're so dependent on our technology, we're suckers. There's no way we're doing this manually. So we have to keep this stuff up. Talking about doing it manually, eh, sure. Some of it can be done manually, but not for long. The reality is, you folks have to do a damn good job at keeping it up. That's what it's about. We are so dependent on this at this point, it has to stay on. Now, this is the part of the presentation where things get weird. Okay, who remembers the day you became a bank, other than the banking and finance people in here? They don't count. Anybody? Okay. Data is money. Data is the new oil. Data is the new gold. Whatever buzz phrase you want to use, Everything you do now no longer depends on the electrons, the water, the gas, the product you're making. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter. You may think it does. What matters is your data. Why? Could you run without it? We talk about ransomware, and Mark, great quote, go back in time two years, build a time machine. <clears throat> if your company got ransomware and wiped everything out, how long could you go? Like without backups, right? From scratch, manual. Could you do it? No, you can't. Data is your business. It's that simple. Now, not just for your operations. Data is also your future. 
If Google and Facebook can make billions off of, man, that taco was fantastic, or my shampoo is really crappy, I'm not going to buy that shit anymore. Um, they're making billions of dollars off innocuous crap data. Billions. Freaky, scary amounts of money. How much is your data worth? Probably a lot more. So there are some organizations that have smelled the money. So what they're doing in some cases is they're taking all of the data they get from their systems, they're inserting more and more technologies to get more data, they're taking all of that data, analyzing that data, slicing it, dicing it, in some cases anonymizing if it's customer data and reselling it to everybody who will buy it. Funny thing is, everybody's buying. Data is worth sick, crazy amounts of money right now. There is a time in the not too distant future where you will make more money off of the data than the electrons, than the water, than the product itself. That sounds crazy, but it's true. Why? Because you can no longer buy analog equipment, and installing sensing in analog equipment and instrumentation is a challenge. We've been doing it for a long time, we're good at it, but it's still a challenge. It's far easier to do with digital components. You want to buy analog? eBay. That's your option, pretty much. No one's, sell no one's buying, no one's selling new analog gear anymore. It's all digital. Everything is digital. So what happens <clears throat> when in your plant, in your facility, in your refinery, in your system, what happens when every single piece of equipment you buy generates a data stream? And you ask, why would you do that? Well, because of operational efficiency. When you can know your environment like that, you can understand every single thing it's doing at the microscopic level, man, that's an awesome amount of data. I want to know that about my system. I can get much more efficient. I can make my products better. I can get a much longer mean time between failures for my equipment. If that piece is supposed to fail in 10 years and it's got another 15 years of life on it, I want to know that. I just saved a million bucks on that piece of hardware. Pump, you know, whatever it might be. It makes sense because it makes money. But what happens when all of those devices generate data? What do you do with all that data? There's no way you can house it all, right? There's no way you can analyze it all. But what we're trying to do is get all of this stuff to sense and talk back so we can get our system to do the intelligent things. We're going to use machine learning. We're going to use AI. We're going to find ways so that the system can do things on its own. You've seen flocks of birds, schools of fish, herds of wildebeest. They're a unique organism. Each fish is a unique fish. Each bird is a unique bird. When confronted with weird weather patterns, the entire flock of birds moves and shifts. The school of fish goes around threats or goes towards food, senses differences in the current, and the whole thing will align. It's called emergent intelligence. My background is actually biology, not security. Emergent intelligence is a very real thing in biology. When you aggregate large sets of organisms together, they gain some higher intelligence somehow. We don't know. It works. But it's there. We're seeing the same thing in our technology, just by its very nature, but now we're using technology to advance that and accelerate that so that we can actually get this intelligence in the system, the ghost in the machine. We're trying to get there faster. Reasons for that are all over the board, um, but the reality is humans make mistakes. We go back to Hamlin's razor again. We want to try to automate as much as possible. We want the system to sense some problem and automatically fix the problem which is a good thing, but the reality is in most cases, it's really about money. I mean, if a lot of the stuff we put in originally for sensing in the field was so that someone didn't have to get in a truck and have some windshield time. Yeah, not because that person gets grumpy about it, which they do. It's because it costs us more in fleet maintenance and insurance and all of the other intangible costs to put someone's butt in that truck and have them drive out in the field. Again, it's about money. That's really what it's all about. We're doing this so we can make more money. So we're going to have all of this data. Everything's going to generate a data stream. We're going to be using these incredibly high horsepower machines to help us get intelligence out of our system. Are you actually prepared to do all of that as some small operating organization? Hell no. You can't afford all that. There's no way you could afford it. There's no way you could staff it. What is happening is third parties are going to do this for you. Someone else will do this faster, better, cheaper than you can. You just can't do this on your own. And frankly, it doesn't make sense. I mean, that's a whole reason cloud or really someone else's computer. Um, that, that's why this happened. 
because it's actually easier for someone else to do this on scale than it is for you. So eventually we will do all of this incredible sensing and data mining and data gathering and collection aggregation analysis will be done on someone else's turf. Yes, this does mean that your operational data will be in someone else's cloud. That is a reality. And you can bitch about SCADA and cloud all you want. I'm sorry, but you got no choice. It's going to happen. Again, this is your job. This is what you signed on for. If you can't secure this, get out of the game. Or put your big boy pants on, big girl pants on, and get to work. Figure it out. We've got to find a way to do this because this is the direction we're being dragged. Like it or not, but stuff will be in the cloud, stuff will be intelligent, it's all going to have a million data streams, and it's going to be very difficult to secure or figure out even where the hell it is because it's going to be distributed across X number of boxes in possibly X number of countries. Hard problem. You're smart. You can figure this out. You got this. So what are we going to do to solve the problem? I'm sure the first thing we're going to do is go out and buy a whole bunch of more boxes, little blinky lights and servers and data centers that do all kinds of crafty things, and we're going to have yet another security widget in some data center, right? Because those have worked so well over time. No, they haven't. We're insane. We keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If you don't think about this problem differently and come at it from a different angle and get really creative, you're going to continue to do the same crap we've always done, and you're going to get the same crap result we've always gotten. Organizations will get breached. Why? Because your adversaries have people, money, and time, and you don't. This is a different problem. This is a bigger problem. This is a much more complex problem. Blinky lights in racks are not going to solve this. It's going to take some different thinking. It, yes, new technology will be there. And yes, that new technology will do good things. And yes, you should still buy it. I'm sorry, but it's true. But the reality is, it's not going to solve the problem. It doesn't make the problem go away. It minimizes some of that bulk risk down to where the really hard stuff is left for you smart people to figure out. That's what's left. So the point is, do not trust technology as your sole solution to our future. It will fail you. Okay, we've talked about regulation. I might know some things about regulation. Um, I'm going to make a brand new regulation today. Right here, right now, I'm your regulator. If you ride a bike, you must lock your bike to a provided bike rack with a U-lock or a cable lock. This bike is compliant. It's not secure. It's not usable. It's not function, but it damn sure is compliant. Best example was the target hack we heard from Dragos. Yes? And then they got sued because they were compliant and they still got hacked. We know that compliance doesn't equal security. Regulation will not save you from this, but regulation is necessary. Uh, I've seen this in many different places. Uh, America's gone through it. Many countries are going through it too. You're going through it with your NIS and other areas. Regulation is you must be this tall to ride the ride, right? That's at least the table stakes to play. If you can't at least do this much, then you don't deserve to be at the table. You are not allowed to participate in the game. Understand that is as far as regulation can take you. Management has a hard time understanding this because typically if you say, oh, we're compliant, management says, great, stop spending money, you're done. We're going to go do other things. It's different. Regulation has to be described as this is where we start. This is, uh, this is what allows us to participate. Now that we're in the game, now that we're at the table, what do we do from there? And in order for the organization to make more money, we have to find other ways to go beyond the compliance space, the bare minimum, to actually get this organization where it needs to be. So my only thing I can think of after seeing lots of different technologies, lots of different approaches, uh, the security technologies that are designed to protect them, even some of the future ideas we've got with security technologies, the only thing I can think of is people. Because it still comes down to people every single time. Whether it's the automation paradox and we put in a billion machines with a billion commands, fantastic instructions, idiot proof, still relies on a human to take an action, to set all of that in place. It will always come down to people, always does. Uh, every time the security technologies fail and the bad guys get through, the technology failed and the bad guys got through. <laughs> what was detected, some operator, some person said, huh, that looks weird. Why is it doing that? 
what I would like is not an IDS, an IPS, uh, any of that. I want an APS. I want an aware person system. That's what I want because that's the most important part of any program you've got. Uh, we do social engineering engagements. We stop doing them because the recommendation every time is more security awareness. Don't spend 10 grand on an assessment where we're going to get in every, we have 150% success rate. It's insane. We will break the people. The solution is always security awareness. We need aware people that know what to do when things go wrong, know what to say when they see something odd. We need security professionals that think about this differently, that don't come at it with a no, 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 but yeah, if they can get creative and think about where the future is, not where the past is. I've seen a lot, uh, too many discussions that still have our roots in where technology was, not where technology will be. And if you're securing yesterday, I'm not gonna hire you. No one else will. It's, we've got to secure tomorrow. So I'm gonna argue that the goal is not security. Now, you may all consider yourself security professionals. That's great. I appreciate the title. I am one myself. But when I talk to anybody with money, and I want their money for security, and they want more money too so they can give it to me for security, um, I don't talk about security. I never mention the word once. I talk about business process. I talk about resilience. I talk about loss avoidance. I talk about all kinds of things that are not related to security but are actually tied to money. Because at the end of the day, you're not doing security for the sake of security. Well, you might be, but the company's not paying you to do it for that. You're doing security so that the company can keep the lights on, can keep the water flowing, can keep making product. It's a balanced risk. You have to secure it just enough so they can continue and they don't lose money. So it's not about security. It's about resilience. You have adversaries that have you outgunned. You will be breached eventually. What do you do then? Do you respond well? Can you come from backup? Can you limp along with an adversary inside your environment and continue to keep moving? Can you keep the lights on even with an active threat actor inside your platform? That is the step beyond security. That is your goal. Stopping the bad guys. Yes, you should do that too, good luck. <laughs> but the reality is something like that will happen. Your job is not to stop it, your job is to try to stop it and try to figure out how to keep moving when it does happen. It's resilience that you're really looking for. It's how do you keep moving when you have a full compromise or you're, you're hit super hard. Okay, so that's all mine. That's all I gotta talk about right now. I'm sure we got some questions, I hope. Uh, that's how to find me, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, all right, any, any questions? Oh yeah, well. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can I'm going to give this there. to you yeah. later on. But yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, thank you. It was lot, like yeah. listening to my own mind, actually. Thank you. For a while. So, thank you very much. Uh, enriching. We have a few questions. Uh, excuse me. So, how often do you think the regulations should be updated with all the tech changes innovations? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The funny thing is hackers are way faster than laws. Um, laws are slow. Technology, innovation, and uh, hacking techniques are way faster. The laws should be updated as fast as they can be. But I think the challenge is trying to update laws quickly also breaks the legal system. It breaks the, um, the standard congressional or uh, structures that create those laws. Having been on the inside of that, I would say the challenge is as hard as your job is to find new ways to think about security and resilience, their job is just as hard to think of ways that to create regulation that doesn't have to be updated so frequently. Yes. So if you can create more future-proof regulation, then you'll have to do less work. So when I talk to regulators, I say, do you want more work and more pain and more bitching and complaining from the pitchforks and torches and the masses out there that you wrote bad regulation? Take a little bit longer, write some regulation that actually lives longer through the technology span, and there'll be less updates necessary. Well, uh, won't that uh, potentially lead to uh, more ambiguous uh, mm -hmm. regulations and, yeah. and open for interpretation? And yes. Kind of back to yeah, excellent those point. kind of problems. Uh, the challenge there is to not hire like green college kids for your assessors or auditors. You need seasoned people mm -hmm. uh, to do the assessments and audits without agendas. Um, and that's the hard, the, the hard part's not really right in the regulation. The hard part is, is auditing to the regulation or assessing yeah. to the regulation. Uh, I give NERC SIP a hard time. It's actually not a bad regulation. Uh, it makes sense. The America failed really in the implementation of the monitoring and enforcement program. It's, that's, that's where our failure was. 
So I would say, yes, it does require more skilled auditors and assessors. Uh, those people should go through some, I don't want to say certification, but they need to be able to meet some level of skill set. What I've seen traditionally is the legal bodies that write smart laws want that, and they go out to get those people, and then they're going to offer them this much money to do that job. Yeah. <laughs> so it becomes a challenge there. So yeah, I think course. if they could get funding for that, it might actually work better. There's, some places have done better than, than others. But. So uh, would it make sense to, to try to hire people that actually know in security engineering uh, to the factory floors? I yes. mean, view their role uh, equal to the process engineer, for example? Yes. Um, the prob yes, that is a good idea. The problem is for some organizations that doesn't scale because those people are expensive and there's not many of them. So there's an artificial market driving the cost of those professionals higher uh, internationally. So uh, the challenge we typically see is you have to outsource that. You end up having to buy slices of some of those experts to help come in and check things and even during your audits and assessments, have them there with you uh, to support you through the process. So you would think that governments, for example, would be interested in training more people and start to uh, yes. create training programs for this and educations in universities and whatever. Yes. Training to programs get these are people. great. Uh, universities can move a little slower in some cases, but the, tech, the, the, the level of education is deeper because um, you have to spend more time doing it. Uh, but in reality, even certification programs or something like that would work as well. But the, we have to get enough people educated and moving. Um, what typically drives the education area is we, what I found the interesting paradox or the conundrum here is there's plenty of money. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, it's just Where maybe it it's not sexy enough <laughs> or something, I gotta put some lipstick on it, but it, it's, we, we don't have enough people coming into the field to get the training. Right. Um, but the money's there if, the, if they go through it. Okay, so that sounds yeah. reassuring. Okay, thank you. Another question, is there a need for a human in the loop for controlling and managing critical infrastructure? I think that you almost answered that. Before. Some cases yes, some cases no, depending upon the amount that you're going to lose in the process. Um, protection systems still have to operate. Uh, I would say that that's an area where you could, you could eliminate the human in almost all cases, because that's their design. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of process that does still require a human to be in the loop. I mean, I've seen some big... Uh, under frequency or under voltage load shedding schemes that would drop massive amounts of like entire countries on a grid. Um, that should have, it should be armed, and, but the human operator should be the one to trigger it. So there are some areas, once you get to a degree of automation, the human operator should definitely be involved. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were talking about automation generation, yes. uh, automatic generation control mm -hmm. yesterday, and that's typically something that you'd like the human to vet before they yes. the enforce, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you drive the business case for cybersecurity? What are the key points to take into account? Don't talk about security. I know that sounds crazy, but it's real. Don't. The minute you say security to an executive, you're like, oh, God, security again. Their eyes roll back, and they get that cold sweat thing, right? It's, uh, they don't want to hear about it because it's frightening, it's scary. Um, those of you who know Jack Wood said he's got a fantastic analogy. It's like um, if you are unhealthy, and you know you need to get healthy, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, oh God, you got diabetes, you got high blood pressure, you got cholesterol issues, you're gonna die in five months, right? If you don't get healthy. So you gotta get healthy. So you go into the gym, and you see these healthy, beautiful people working out on machines you have no freaking clue how to use, and you know you gotta eat broccoli for the next year and a half, and okay, it's daunting. But it's not something you can just step into and say, I'm an expert, I got this. You basically need a personal trainer. So. This, think about, about it that way. You are the executive's personal trainer to help them understand security without going, dude, you're fat. You got to get off this. You got to get healthy. So you've got to find a way to approach them that says, wait, start with this machine. Start easy. Do these things first. Maybe eat broccoli once a week. Next week, try two dishes of broccoli and get them on, on pace. But don't talk about security because they'll immediately just say, nope, we're not talking about that. That scares me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Interesting to see if anyone is going to take you up on that. <laughs> it, uh, it works. Try it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks. Uh, with technology advancing and information volumes increasing exponentially, are we on the brink of a technology <laughs> technological for a technological singularity? <laughs> on the brink of. We, I th we may have passed it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Probably so. Yeah. I mean, at some point. I mean, is it you know like Skynet yet? Not not yet, but it's kind of freaky to see that, you know, yeah, everything will be generating data and the systems will be doing their own self-healing and self-management, but it's close. Yeah, and you've seen the robots from uh, the Boston Mechan Mechanics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for them to have like a badge and a baton and a gun for policing of, of activities. Oh yeah, that's, they probably that's like, already do, but they don't put okay, them on YouTube I'll, yet. All bets are off when that happens, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, I don't have any, well, we did get two more questions. Let's see if we can actually yeah. place them to you. 
All right, that's okay. That's okay. Mod I'm, I'm a little more actively troll filtering right now. So. <laughs> um, if you could make uh, one and only one regulation for critical infrastructure, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> one and only one. Breach notification. Sorry? Breach notification. Breach notification. If I could make one and only one, I would offer indemnity for breach notification so that if you did notify, then you would be, in, in most cases, depending upon the egregiousness of the violation, uh, protected legally, safe harbor. Uh, the reason I say that is um, <sighs> conversation on risk. Uh, best analogy is healthcare. Um, if I you know, drink and smoke and eat terribly, I'm probably going to die by the age of 50. We're not guessing, we know this. We know this because we have hundreds of years of actuarial data, real data from real dead people that we've amassed over the years. Actuarials, that's what risk and insurance people do. Um, that's what, believe it or not, underwriters laboratories does. It's they, they decide what they're going to do in terms of a risk balance. But we know about health and we know about health care because we have hundreds of years of real data. In the security space, when something happens, we don't talk about it. And we certainly don't share the data. So the reality is we're guessing. We're, we're just, we're guessing. We, we don't have, we really know because we don't have any real data to support it. Well, we have very little bits of data and we're trying to aggregate that data to infer some sort of the right path, but we're still guessing. And maybe we're guessing right and our gut instinct is working well, but we need real, actual risk data to know what the hell is working and what isn't. Um, I think that's the best way to get there. I think the best long-term value and easiest to regulate would be that. And if you've got multiple breach notifications, I think the invisible hand of the market will figure out whether you should continue or not. Right. You don't need a regulator to tell you that. So, uh, but, but you think that we would uh, have to strengthen the detection as well? Yeah. I mean, try to look. Uh, because absolutely. if you're not looking... If you're not looking, well, then that would be one of those like, potential egregious violations. If you weren't even looking, well, <laughs> sorry, your execs go to jail. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. One more. Do you see a way... Uh, for regulation to get ahead of technology, how can the cycle be broken where only existing technology is regu regulated? Um, yeah, I, I think it's possible. I think it's very difficult. Um, I have a decent example out of the US. Um, in the 70s, the Federal Aviation Administration um, required you to report everything. If a bug hit the plane, you know, near misses, anything, you had to report it all, and you had to report it to the FAA, the regulator. Mm. Um, as soon as people began reporting these things, well, the FAA came in and said, whoa, looks like you have all these other violations going on in here. Uh, well, suddenly, the next day or the next second, people stopped reporting. <laughs> nope, no bugs on these planes. We're good. Uh, so what, the FAA realized that, and they said, ah, crap, we didn't get this right. So they, now they put everything through NASA, which is an entirely different organization. Mm -hmm. NASA anonymizes the data and provides the FAA with quarterly, weekly, monthly, whatever, mm -hmm. anonymized reports based on real data that they've got. And then the FAA makes regulations based on that. So I think that model may give regulators a chance to get ahead of some of the technology pieces and at least regulate based on facts and real trends in the industry. All right, that's an interesting yeah. approach. Well, uh, no more questions. So I Fantastic. Thank, thank you awesome. very much. Thank Patrick. you, everyone. I appreciate it. Yeah.